So the announcement is that I'm going to talk to you about one of the 97 things that every UX practitioner should know. And I kind of retitled it a little bit and gave it the actual title of the one thing that I want you to know, and that is visualizing requirements during the workshop. So kind of the idea for why I'm standing here, I'll start a credit tweet last year from Dan Berlin. He um, used to work at a UX consultancy in Boston and he now has his own company after the end. And there he was asking about, I'm happy to announce the submission and reviewing process for the O'Reilly Media book. I'm editing 97 things UX designers need to know want to submit a chapter for consideration. And I thought, hmm, officially I'm not a UX designer because I'm the Mahara Partic Lead for an open source, or Partic Lead for an open source project, but we actually do quite a bit of UX as part of the project. And I had run a few workshops that I think ran, went really, really well when we were looking into business analysis, UX stuff, and so I sent in an idea for the chapter and the idea was the following. Kind of working in a company like Catalyst where we have clients, we oftentimes need to engage in requests for proposals, RFPs. Um, yeah, I see some people smiling, others rather cringing. And that's really it because when you are in RFP conversations, or when you're kind of talking through things, the requirements, sometimes, oh, most of the time actually, you're just sitting in front of spreadsheets. So you can't see this is blurred out on purpose so that we are not identifying anybody. But really, you're sitting in front of a spreadsheet that might have seven tabs all together between, say, 100 and 600, maybe even more requirements. And you don't have enough screen real estate to see even a quarter of it. And so I thought when we were invited to a potential client um, to talk through the requirements with them, that I thought this is not going to work because we can come with eight three sheets and we are all just sitting there putting our noses into, into the spreadsheets, not looking at each other. And it's really hard reading spreadsheets that have six point font. So just before then, I've been reading a book uh, called Game Storming. Incidentally, also an O'Reilly book. And there they talk about, um, or have quite a lot of sort of recipes or ideas of how you can make meetings interesting. So going away from the normal thing of people walk into a meeting, sit down, turn off their ears, and then after an hour walk out again. And so I thought, well, this is kind of a meeting that we are going to, so how can we make that interesting? Because I want people to enjoy their time in the meeting. And so what I came up with was this. And you're holding some of those cards, of course, on the template cards in your hand, that we put all the requirements onto cards, one requirement per card, and then lay it out onto a table so that people can walk around, they can touch the requirements, they can read them, nobody's ever touching the spreadsheet. And so how does it work? Well, there are five categories altogether that I wanted to put the, the cards in, all the requirements, because um, when we have a spreadsheet, they are oftentimes listed according to function. So front-end, back-end, authentication, server requirements, security requirements, and all of that. But when you're just talking through requirements, if we just go from, from the first to the last one, we, don't, we haven't really prioritized them. We haven't really grouped them. Sometimes one thing is on the, on the first sheet, sometimes the next thing is on the last one. And so what I really wanted to achieve also as part of this workshop was not just number one, um, go through the most important requirements, but number two, very importantly, of course, also show them how much the software that we were pitching actually already can do and actually fulfills the requirements. And that's why there are these five categories, and you can rename them or you can just have four categories, 
where there is no end configure, purposely in green because it already exists, it's out of the box functionality, might just need a switch flipped, um, and then you have the functionality available that you want. Development without questions. Yep, we understand the requirements. They are so straightforward, we don't need to discuss them here in this meeting. Double check. Hmm, I think we know what you mean, but we just want to make sure not that we are assuming something incorrectly. Clarify. Yeah, we are kind of on track. We think we know what you mean, but can you please give us a little bit more detail so that we can make sure that yes, what you think or what we think you need is actually what you need. And then the last category in red, because that's the most difficult one, is analyze more. The requirements in the RFP are so high level that you can do a hundred different ways. And those are not categories that you see in an RFP. The spreadsheets are not organized that way. But during a workshop with a client, we kind of need to get to the meat very quickly, to, to the topic, and only focus on the important stuff. So I don't really want to spend time in the workshop of, on anything for no one configure because it was already there and we didn't have to talk about it. So the cards that you are all holding in your hands, and those are kind of really stock cards so that you can pick it up, don't have to fill up, not flimsy, so you don't have to fumble around. And um, what's on there is really the color for the category that I grouped it, the requirement number and the a short title of it, then also any prioritization that they had already done, the actual description of the requirement that is in the spreadsheet, because what I wanted to avoid is that anybody, and now the microphone turned off. Yeah, I think I just needed to turn it back on. <laughs> so description from the spreadsheet, uh, because what I wanted to avoid is that anybody needed to look at the spreadsheet at all. I did not want to see anybody getting a spreadsheet out. And then importantly also our response, because the response was on the spreadsheet as well, so there wasn't anything hidden for the client. And so there was then space for making notes during the workshop. And of course, on the back side, you had plenty of space as well. At the bottom, there was also a related field. So that was just mainly for me as facilitator to, to remember if anybody kind of picked up the cards, ah, yeah, we might also want to look at this requirement without needing to stick in the same uh, stack all the time. Because sometimes related things could be in one category and in another category. And then how do you print it? Well, you take a regular A4 sheet, put four pages, I used um, LibreOffice and Press, made a PDF, put four, printed four pages on one page. Only custom thing really was the stock paper, and then we needed a cutter to cut it through. And that was very easy to do, low key, low cost. Um, well, we did need a color printer um, because I kind of did rely a bit on the colors to sort them as well. And this is the table, not in real life, but kind of what it could look like. And by grouping things into those categories, and you see here the fifth category is even missing, it works with four as well, I find, is that the client can see very quickly oh my gosh, all of this is already done, we have that. We don't have to worry about it, we get that. Um, because we are of course working with an open source product that already exists, and therefore we wanted to show the client, well, if you go with us, you get most of it already. And then at the beginning of the workshop, you have all these other categories filled in as well. Um, the little blue stickies here are just indicating a topic because I grouped things topic-wise within these individual columns to again be able to just grab one of those stacks then, pick it up and discuss together rather than needing to go to 
requirement one, five, and so on, and get back into it. And so if you stacked things, that's what it would look like, for example, potentially, ideally, before the session. So this is what it could look like, for example, at the start, that you have lots of green already, few things requiring developer questions, to, uh, double checking, clarifying, and analyzing more. And then at the end of the workshop, ideally you have something like this. Because during the workshop, when you make notes on the cards, you also have your highlighters with you so that you can change the color. Because ideally, a lot of the stuff from double check, clarify, and analyze actually moved into those first two categories, either no and configure or death with no questions. And that was the whole purpose of the workshop, to go through as many requirements as possible and for our team to get more clarity on what was required so that we could give them better pricing, better pricing information in the, uh, as part of the RFP. Now, back to the book. So I thought, hmm, I think this is an idea that falls into the category of UX, BA. Kind of is a nice one because you don't have to work with spreadsheets and you can, it's interactive, people can participate, they can look at the cards, they can touch them, and um, it's a more relaxed atmosphere because you actually look at each other across the table rather than everybody looking down into the spreadsheets. But then, yeah, came the writing and editing part because it's really tough getting that into 600 words and not using any images, not being allowed to use images. So that was a big challenge. But all 97 authors of the book managed that. And so if you are interested in UX, there are five categories covered in the book, which is career, strategy, design, content, and research. And that's the end. This is the actual book came out in June, um, both online and also in uh, mainly in paper actually. And it's really fantastic to see lots of different voices being represented and I'm not on in one of them, so no puzzle piece looking for that. Um, and um, yeah, having been part of that community of writers and now being able to read everybody else's stories. But wait, there is actually more. Because while it was a book, um, Dan actually thought, well, we could also make a podcast out of it, since lots of people are listening to podcasts these days. And so anybody or any author of the book, or book chapters, could participate in the podcasts. And so every week on Tuesday, North American time, a new episode is released which basically looks into one chapter. So if you want to consume the book differently and also, also hear a little bit about the backstories of the authors, how they came into your ex, what is important to them, extra tips they have, then you can listen to the podcast. It's available on all the major podcasting platforms. And that's it for me. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, Grant, you have a question. How long did it take to prepare for the workshop with all of that? Because you must have had to go through the spreadsheet in advance. Yeah, so Grant asked how long it took uh, to prepare for, for the workshop. Um, the, work, the preparation definitely took quite a while because I needed to copy and paste everything from the spreadsheet into the cards. So that's, that's a labor that you don't really get around very easily, unless you write some sort of script. Some of you might be able to do that and kind of write a macro for, for spreadsheeting software and um, put that into LibreOffice in press or somewhere else. But oftentimes I also needed to adjust the font size just a little bit because of the, the amount of content. Um, but I must say it was actually really good to take that time because that way I could also put questions on it. 
So what I what you didn't see on the cards is um, that some of them could actually also have questions. So after having read the description or a response, if I then wanted something specific to have clarified, then I could write that on there directly. So that during the workshop, I didn't have to remember it, um, because if you have 90 or 120 or more requirements, it was a bit hard to remember what all the individual questions were. And so I just put that onto the cards and that was really helpful. Did you win the business? Yes, in both cases that I used the workshop. So we, we did, we, we were fortunate to work with those clients, yes. Rob? Um, I was curious how hard it is to uh, print them out. Do you, do you need a special printer to handle that? No, nope, not at all. Um, standard printer, I think this is um, 120 grams or 160 gram paper. Right. And then it's just an A4 sheet. So regular A4 cards or stock stock paper and then cut it through that was the easiest so I didn't worry about if they were a little crooked or they are not all exactly the same size because sometimes when you put three sheets into a cutting machine then it kind of gets a bit bad but because they were all lying on the table it didn't really matter so much. Christina have you tried the mail merge functions to generate the cards? No I haven't tried mail merge for it um, because I was using impress so I didn't know that mail merge exists there, because I only know it from writer. But I found um, using a presentation software worked better for me, since I could then put four pieces on one and the margins worked really well and I could work with the borders and all of that, which I found a bit easier than using writer there. Yeah, fair enough. Rob? Um, I was also curious uh, whether this was inspired by another um, card-based system. I'm makes me think there's a thing called Zettel Custom, which um, is kind of popular in circles. Yeah, so question is whether it was inspired by another card sort, well, card sort activity organization. or organization. Um, there are card sorting things in BAUX, um, but no, no, wasn't inspired by any of those. It was really me trying to come up with an idea of really putting the challenge to myself to make this workshop a bit more interesting, um, having read the game storming book. And in there they have a number of ways of yeah, working with post-its and using whiteboards and flip charts, but post-it notes sometimes don't stick, and then you can't really prepare them. Handwriting can be iffy. We had a lot of text, so I thought, well, I need to print something and putting something on a table would actually work really well. So yeah, it's coming from. The, the thing, apart from the pre preparation, the thing that strikes me as the biggest challenge was conveying all this without pictures. Yeah, it's <laughs> really, and um, I think that is really hard. I mean, for the blog post, I do have the pictures included on, on our website um, back in the day. 2016 or late 2015 when I ran the first workshop because it certainly helps since it's a visualization activity and so if you can't visualize if you don't actually see what it looks like I find it very hard um, but what was really good for this chapter is that you had to pare down to the basics because we really cut down that long blog post incredibly and I think you can get the idea of what you want to do and then people can always email me. <laughs> and yes, if anybody wants the uh, the templates for the cards, I do have have that as an ODP file, and I'm very happy to share that with you. <laughs>